Hi, everyone. Welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. On this episode, I am delighted to be talking with author David Mack. David, thank you for jumping in and joining, talking. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. My, my pleasure. Thanks for saying yes. And I know that we are talking about a particular book of yours, which is soon to be out in the world, and that is Picard Firewall. Uh, love I love the universe of Picard and Star Trek and uh, actually used Picard as an example in my English class last year when the season three of the show was out as uh, a work that I really enjoyed. So for some writing activities, oh, really? more Picard than some of my students probably wanted, but nevertheless. <laughs> That's very interesting. Oh, well. Um, so curious about, I, I always like to ask about those origin questions or genre questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I love science fiction. I'm curious about what the genre allows you to do creatively. Well, I think one of the benefits of working in science fiction, fantasy, or speculative fiction of any kind is that you can develop allegories uh, or you know symbolic relationships to represent issues in the real world that maybe would feel too on the nose if you were to come at them directly. Uh, but by presenting, you know, a science fiction uh, allegory for that issue, you can sort of deconstruct it without the emotional baggage that comes with the original discussion. And it makes it possible, I think, to look at uh, perhaps sensitive issues at a remove and really sort of say, all right, well, what's wrong with this? And, uh, and, and what's, What's the approach? How, what do we do about it? Yeah, yeah, uh, kind of parables of the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, much as Star Trek back in the 1960s did this with various episodes, let that be your last battlefield. A uh, private little war was about Vietnam. Um, you know, a taste of Armageddon was about the threat of mutually assured destruction through nuclear war. Um, then you had the issue, you know, the the episode. Uh, with Lokai and Beale, you know, the guy's half black on the left as opposed to half black on the right, and they're at each other's throats, and to outsiders, it looks ridiculous. They say, you're the same species. No, can't you see? He's black on the left side. I'm black on the right side. <laughs> right. Like, people, people will find a reason to fight about anything. They'll mm -hmm. find tribalism is a disease, and people will find any reason to create an outgroup uh, that can be, you know, dehumanized and, and vilified. And the task, the labor of society, uh, of civilization, is to get past tribalism, uh, to find reasons to stop creating outgroups and start realizing that everybody is part of the same group, uh, which is, you know, in our case, humanity. And hopefully someday we'll be able to embrace not only that, but an even larger concept of sentient beings. Mm -hmm. Love that. There's that positive direction that Star Trek takes and that sort of positive messaging. Love that aspect of it. Um, since since we're talking the universe of Trek, what was your introduction to that world like? Well, I started with Trek as a young kid. I wasn't old enough to see it in first run. I was born just as the series was ending mm -hmm. in 1969. Uh, I was born shortly before the moon landing um, in the uh, May of 1969 is when I was born. Uh, I grew up watching Star Trek, the original series, in syndicated reruns. Uh, Mom would just you know, plant me in front of the TV, and along with Mr. Rogers and Sesame Street and mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Villa Alegre and uh, you know, Electric Company and whatever, there were always Star Trek. And Mom found Star Trek unobjectionable. So, you know, like a duckling that imprints on the first moving thing that it sees... I am printed on Star Trek. Uh, Star Trek set my moral template, my template mm -hmm. for, you know, what what is the way to live? What is the best way to be in the world? And it's to be part of a team. It's to be part of a society that cares for its own people, uh, that accepts people, that is, uh, you know, committed to the ideas that it is better to create than to destroy. It is better to forge bonds of friendship than it is to... Uh, to sever them. It's better to have peace than war. It's better to heal than to harm. Mm -hmm. These are the basic precepts on which Star Trek is built. Uh, it is better to create alliances through friendship, cooperation, and mutual benefit 
than through conquest, imperialism, force, uh, coercion, that these are ultimately self-defeating activities uh, that are not sustainable, not even in a short run and certainly not at an interstellar scale. That if you want to have a civilization that is sustainable, particularly across interstellar distances, those relationships have to be uh, mutual. They have to be consensual. Uh, they have to be uh, basically, you know, people have to come together because they want to come together. They have to be about cooperation. Uh, yeah. You can't yeah. really, you know, hold together something across such a vast distance through force. It's ultimately, it's not tenable. You wind up expending so much energy that way, trying to control things that eventually you lack the energy to do basic things like take care of your own home, take care of your own people, provide for uh, your, your own uh, basic needs, and eventually you see collapse, um, which is why cooperation and, uh, and peace is better than empire and colonialism through force. Yeah, yeah. and the value of community. Mm -hmm. Very much so. So what was it like to craft in the kind of the Picard corner of the universe? Because as I mentioned, that's one of my favorites. And I love the Seven of Nine character. I love the um, Next Generation and all of those characters and storylines. Well, this was my first time sort of jumping into this new 25th century or late 24th century uh, setting developed by the new TV producers for Picard. Before this, I'd been writing uh, mostly in the continuity of the previous TV series, the previous movies. And then for about 20 years, the books had their own sort of shared literary continuity that picked up where the shows and movies left off. And we kind of did our own thing and uh, developed our own consequences and had, you know, serial continuity from book to book, year to year. And then all that had to go away with the advent of Star Trek Picard because its continuity and assumptions about what had happened in the intervening decades, obviously it was gonna be different from what we had done. And there's no way, there was really no way to reconcile the two. So we sort of did a big swan song with the Star Trek Coda trilogy and closed off that 20 some odd year literary project. And now it's time to embark on new adventures. And that was what led to me being invited to write a Star Trek Picard novel about seven of nine. When, how, and why did she join the Fenris Rangers? And this, my editor knew this was of interest to me because when Picard first premiered and I was watching, I believe, the fifth episode, Stardust City Rag, uh, written by my friend Kirsten Beyer. Uh, and they sort of go into the Fenris Rangers and there's some talk with Seven about this, that, and the other thing. And the establishment of the Fenris Rangers was just this tantalizing concept to me, this whole new thing, this non-Starfleet thing and I immediately paused the episode and emailed my editor from my phone saying I would like to write a Fenris Rangers novels please uh, <laughs> and she immediately replied back no Fenris Rangers novels right now the show doesn't know what it wants to do with them uh, we're going to have to wait for permission from LA well I had to wait about two years to get that permission from LA, but finally it came through and they said, all right, we're, we're finishing up a card and we're not doing a whole lot with the Fenris Rangers. You can write a Fenris Rangers novel. Yeah. Yeah. And we went, thank you. <laughs> and uh, I got right to work when the editors asked me to. And so I ended up doing this deep dive into the psyche and the worldview of seven of nine, yeah. uh, because as they established just a few choice details in Star Trek Picard about why she became a Fenris Ranger rather than say going into Starfleet. Uh, but it doesn't say, for instance, why did she choose Fenris Rangers as opposed to just leading a civilian life? Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't answer that. But what we were told was she attempted to, uh, first of all, Janeway tried to get her a special commission, an active commission and get her actively installed in Starfleet was refused. She applied to Starfleet Academy and was refused. And after that, Seven said she went full Ranger. So the way it's presented as one following immediately upon the other in dialogue, I took to mean that her decision to become a Fenris Ranger is at least partly a direct consequence of how she was treated by Starfleet and by the Federation. 
So I thought, well, there's got to be a little more to it there. Simply being turned down for the academy uh, can't be enough. So I started digging into and thinking about what is that period of history like for the Federation when Voyager first comes home in 2378, when they've just gotten home. And we're dealing with things like the fact that Voyager has just destroyed the Borg Transwarp uh, hub and their sort of Transwarp network. Uh, we've been dealing with recent things like we're only five years out from the Borg attack on Earth and first contact. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Earth is scarred. Uh, you know, the, the Federation is still seeing the Borg as an existential threat. They are a major foreign uh, entity that is hostile and potentially has the power to end the Federation as a civilization. So they're rightly, you know, on, uh, they're, they're rightly anxious about this. And then suddenly Voyager shows up with Seven of Nine. First of all, her name is a Borg designation that she has chosen to keep. (laughs) Then on top of that, she's got her Borg implants, some of which cannot be removed without killing her. So she is permanently going to be at least part Borg for the rest of her life, at least physically. If not connected to the collective, uh, she may be of free will, but physically she's got Borg nanoprobes in her blood. She's got a, an under layer of like Borg, um, you know, sort of myo, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyway, she's got sort of like a, a layer of Borg muscle tissue underneath her skin, which you see in episodes like Sunkatse in Voyager when she gets wounded and like some of her skin is abraded off. Rather than seeing like red raw, what you're actually seeing is black and silver. You're seeing that she has an under layer of Borg tissue Borg synthetic tissue underneath her human dermis, which is fascinating. I mean, she's this clearly indicates you know she's got probably Borg implants in her bone. There's probably uh, Borg modifications to her muscular structure. We know that the nanoprobes can do everything from bring back the dead. They regenerate cellular tissue. Uh, I mean, they they help improve her oxygen carrying capability. They can improve, uh, you know, body chemistry. They can supercharge adrenaline. They can do all kinds of crazy shit. She's basically a walking super weapon. Mm -hmm. And so the Federation says, do we really want her in Starfleet? What if she's still loyal to the Borg? Because when they try to give her back her name, Annika Hansen, she doesn't want that name. That's not her name. Her name is Seven of Nine. Mm -hmm. The more they insist on calling her Annika, the angrier she gets. Uh, and you see this in Picard with Captain Liam Shaw constantly dead naming her, and she has to keep correcting him. You know, it doesn't matter what my Federation bio record says. It doesn't matter what name I was born with. That's not my name, and you need to figure this out. Yeah. And, of course, you, Liam Shaw knows this. And I think what we can infer in Picard when we're seeing him do this, he's doing it on purpose. Mm-hmm. It's not that he doesn't know that she chose this, uh, you know, the seven of nine is her chosen name. He knows it full well. It's that he has a major, major trauma in his life related to the Borg. And because she is still visibly part Borg and has chosen a Borg designation, uh, it's just, it's a trigger for him. She triggers him. (laughs) And he is so badly traumatized that he is unable to sort of help himself. You know, once triggered, he's lashing out because he's got you know this uh, undercurrent of anger, this undercurrent of fear, of feeling uh, vulnerable, feeling wounded. And so the only way he can deal with that is to lash out with aggression to sort of keep that fear at bay. And so he aggressively dead names uh, Seven. And I think he's doing it because on some level he's scared of her. And he's got trauma related to the board. And then eventually, once he learns to trust her and they become friends, you know, you know, forged under fire together, he stops doing that and he shows her the respect she she deserves. And it's because it's not because he's even really changed his opinion of her. It's that she's helping him realize she is not his trauma. Yeah. Yeah. So he's moving past it. But 20 years earlier, people weren't ready to make that, you know, jump. Mm-hmm. So what I've got going on with uh, Borg, you know, with, with the Borg and the Federation in Firewall is that when she first comes home, the entire Voyager crew just sort of scatters. This is her found family who she's been with now for four years. They've been trying to help her reclaim her humanity. Well, she was trying to date Chakotay, but now Chakotay is off 
according to Prodigy, he's off to the Protostar project. He, he's going to be given captaincy of the Protostar during its uh, shakedown phase. Mm -hmm. So he's doing that. But this is a hyper-classified, top-secret project. Starfleet's not going to let Seven anywhere near that damn thing. So she can't go with him. And that fuels anger, resentment, envy. She envies him. And this causes her to self-sabotage their relationship. She sabotages it because she can't help but get over the fact she's so angry at being shut out. Um, and plus, I was never really convinced that their relationship felt right ever anyway. I mean, even though they, she was technically, you know, some sort of specialist on par with the officers, he was the first officer of the ship. He was in a position of authority and control over her. And she was really sort of not yet fully up to speed on relationships. Um, so I always found their relationship by the end of Voyager a little, little oogie. But, right. but letting that go, you know, putting that to one side. So her family scatters. Uh, everybody off to new jobs. And suddenly this support network that Seven has relied on is gone. She's alone. And, you know, she gets a place to live down in South Africa, down by Cape Town. And, you know, at the beginning of the book, you know, small spoiler, not a big one. Janeway comes to visit her and finds that Seven is packing up her stuff and getting ready to leave. And Janeway says, why? Why are you leaving? And Seven takes her out and shows her the front of her house. And somebody has graffitied it, die, Borg, bitch. And so humans, even in the 24th century, are not above prejudice, not above bigotry, not above fear. Mm -hmm. And somebody does this. And she says, well, according to the local constabulary, it was probably teenage kids. But the cops don't seem to be in any big hurry to figure it out. They don't seem particularly motivated. So Seven decides to leave Earth uh, and go off and sort of just find her own way. She's realizing that there's nothing for her here. There's no, there's no life for her here that's not going to be steeped in this kind of bigotry and abuse and she just doesn't want to live like this anymore and plus Janeway's been going all out trying to you know move heaven and earth for seven to the point where Janeway's starting to hurt her own career starting to hurt her own rep and seven is embarrassed by this not just because she fears for Janeway screwing up her her own career for her benefit but because she's embarrassed that it keeps failing and she's worried that she's doing harm to Janeway by just not getting out of the picture so Seven goes off to sort of go find herself. So what Firewall is, in many respects, it's Janeway, uh, not Janeway, Seven, going on a journey of self-discovery. It's a, a Bildungsroman, basically. It's a coming-of-age tale. Mm -hmm. if you think about it, for 18 years, while she was in the collective, from around the age of six to the age of 24, she missed her childhood. She mm -hmm. missed her adolescence, her young adulthood. All the years when most people are forging the core of their identities, figuring out who they are, uh, what they want to be, what their talents are, where their interests are, uh, what their preferences are, you know, who they're attracted to, what they're attracted to. Uh, at the time of life when most people are figuring this out, she was robbed of all that. And then suddenly, you know, at the age of 24, she's being, you know, forced socialized by the Voyager crew, and they're doing the best they can, but let's be honest, I mean, given the sort of the attitudes of the time when the show was made, their socialization of Seven was a bit heteronormative. Mm -hmm. uh, Cis-heteronormative uh, at that. And so she's, there was really no room to discuss, well, what if she's wired in another way? Nobody ever seemed to think about that. So she goes off to sort of find herself. Uh, and this is sort of a parallel for, at some point, we all have to leave home. At some point, you know, you've got to leave the safety of the protection of your parents, your found family, even your friends. Sometimes, you know, it's, you've got to take that risk of going out there and saying, who am I? What am I capable of? What am I looking for? Mm -hmm. Can I stand on my own two feet? Am I strong enough to be independent? So for Seven, that's what this is about. It's about going out there and saying, I need to know that I can live on my own, that I can make my own life and figure out who I am. But she's still lost. You know, we catch up with her a year later after she's left Earth, and she's still lost. She's living alone, but it's kind of a shitty life. Uh, she's, you know, got a stupid, menial job. She lives in a crappy flat. Uh, she's on a mining world that's kind of ugly and filthy. Um, but she's at least trying to figure some things out. 
and things sort of shift into motion very quickly when she is approached and enticed by someone who says, I can give you back all the dreams that were taken away from you if you just do this one little thing for me. Uh, and a guy basically saying that he's from the Federation Security Agency and he wants her to infiltrate the Fenris Rangers and feed back intel. And if she does this, he's like, I can get you into Starfleet. We can get your citizenship uh, you know, problem fixed. Because the Federation denies her citizenship. They mm -hmm. call her a permanent resident alien. And when Janeway is dealing with this at some point in the middle of the book, she's told flat out, uh, by someone, why do you think that happened? You know, it's not just because, you know, of uh, this or that. It's because she won't change her name back. She has aligned herself with a hostile power, with a, an avowed enemy of the Federation. And it's similar to what the United States did to a number of people, including one guy who uh, I believe changed his name to uh, an Arabic name, uh, a Muslim name, uh, and was seen to have aligned himself with uh, ISIS or Al Qaeda, one of those things. And so they stripped him of citizenship. They actually voided his citizenship, which shouldn't really be possible, but apparently is possible, can be done. Well, that's what the Federation does to Seven. You know, they had declared her legally dead. So for many years, you know, until she was 31 or so and comes home with Voyager, they think she's dead. And then suddenly she's alive. Well, hard enough resurrecting somebody from the dead in a bureaucracy. But then you find out they've also got a new name and that they this name is one designated and given to them by your mortal enemy. Mm -hmm. And is going, do we really want to reactivate her citizenship? Maybe we should keep an eye on this one. And so she's got that prejudice working against her. And it's not until she finds her way into the Rangers that she starts to find a place where she actually feels like she belongs. And so over the course of the book, you know, there's these, there are adventures, there are learning experiences. Uh, one of the things that the Voyager crew was trying to do with Seven for years was get her to open up, uh, to feel empathy, to understand and empathize with others, to feel the feelings of others, to be able to put herself, have a theory of mind where she can say, how does the other person feel? This is something she was never very good at. Uh, but the talent comes to her around the middle of this book and it hits her like a ton of bricks. Um, like the moment, essentially, if you, if you want to sort of a parallel, imagine if a person's natural empathy only finally comes to the fore at the moment they're visiting uh, the scene of a, uh, of a Holocaust concentration camp. Mm -hmm. That's a moment where if that's when your empathy turns on, that's going to be a heavy duty moment. And that's pretty much what happens for Seven. So over the course of the book, she's forced to face atrocities. Um, she's forced to make new bonds, new friendships. She finds the first great love of her life. Uh, and she basically realizes that what she wanted at the beginning of the story is not what she needed. And this is a very important thing in most stories. The character often starts out wanting something not realizing that what's more important is that they need something else. At some point, you need to move past what you think you want, and you need to find what you actually need. And that's what Seven does in the story. She finds what she needs. I love how you've explored the character. I love the knowledge you have of the character and um, the canon and the way that you kind of weave all those things together. And it's not just... <clears throat> the name of the character, but it's this history, it's this uh, trajectory. And you, you were talking at the beginning about some of the the Borg um, sort of apparatus and, and way of being. So uh, I also appreciate that level of scientific knowledge that mm -hmm. comes into building, uh, I guess, what you would consider true science fiction that actually uses science in a fictional way. Yeah. I mean, I've always loved that about Star Trek, even when it's science is sort of pushing into the limits of the fantastic, mm -hmm. there's always at least some sort of attempt to ground it in some notion of physics, some idea of chemistry. Uh, at first, you know, back in the 60s, you know, the, the ideas behind warp speed and how to, how to achieve it were barely theoretical, but, you know, there were some physicists who were already thinking about it. Uh, now there's the, you know, uh, Miguel Alcabari is developing stuff with NASA, Basically, the only impediment is how do you generate enough energy? Um, that's a whole other set of problems. But mathematically, they're saying if 
if you can get this energy threshold or if you can achieve this ne negative zero point, whatever, they said the whole point is that you're basically pinching space in front of the ship and then it bends around and you're basically forcing it around. So the ship itself is not moving. What you're doing is almost like if you had a, a picture like a tube, an elastic mm -hmm. tube, and you've got the ship in the middle. What's happening is you're causing space to pinch behind the ship and space is squeezing, squeezing the ship into motion from here mm -hmm. to here. The ship itself doesn't actually do anything. It's inside this bubble. And within this bubble, all is space normal and relativity applies normally. But outside the bubble, space is being bent and warped. Hmm. And that's what's moving the ship. And it's the it's, it's a crazy idea, but you know, they proved theoretically, yes, it can work. It does have a few minor problems we've not yet worked out. They did figure out mathematically that if you did this with a ship, when it got where it was going and it emerges from the warp bubble, mm -hmm. it would release a burst of energy. And if you happen to be facing the planet you're going to when this happens, this burst of energy could basically fry the planet. This is bad. Right. We haven't figured out how to not do that yet. But one figures, well, you know, it's about learning how to slow down. You know, you, we got to develop better warp breaks or something. Mm -hmm. That's the problem for tomorrow. The first issue is, does the idea work? Uh, second, well, we'll figure out how to stop later. Uh, yeah. But but the principles are there. I mean, uh, quantum transmission, I, I don't like the idea of beaming any more than McCoy does. I think I agree with McCoy. <laughs> Getting into a transporter is basically saying, yes, murder me here and then make a duplicate of me down there. I won't be the duplicate. The duplicate will get all my stuff mm -hmm. and get stuff my life. I'll be dead, but at least the duplicate gets all my stuff. I'll take a rain check on it. Uh, no. I'll take a shuttle, and if the shuttle can't make it, I'll stay here, and we'll talk on the phone. No. I'm not getting in the transporter. No, 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 no. Yeah. yeah. I'll go through a Stargate. A Stargate is a wormhole. You're not <laughs> disintegrated when you step through a Stargate. You are literally, with a Stargate, pinching two points of space together at a, at a threshold, at a membrane, and you pass through the membrane, and you go from here to here. It's like <laughs> a wormhole. That's great. I'm all for the wormhole. I'm all for the Stargate. Stargate, good. Transporter. Bad disintegration and reintegration. That's a, that's a <laughs> don't like it. So, but yeah, so I mean, th there are scientific precepts behind a lot of the stuff, you know, being able to print food uh, from molecular patterns. We're already getting there, we're already working on it. Mm. Uh, and the idea of some of the things the board can do, we're already working on that. We're working on electrical brain interfaces to machinery. We're, we're already working on this stuff. It's not as far-fetched as it might have seemed when it was created. Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting stuff, and uh, Gene Roddenberry and Madeline Lingle would be proud. Sure. But I think what Gene would have always also said was important was not to lose the humanity in all the machinery. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So how can people use their machinery to find out more about the book? If you'd like to know more about the book, you can go to my website, davidmack, M-A-C-K, dot pro. That's davidmack, dot P-R-O. And right there on the front page, you will see Firewall. If this interview goes live before February 27, it'll it say coming soon. Mm -hmm. And after February 27, 2024, it'll say now on sale. And if it's long after 2024 and you're seeing this years later, uh, it'll be under the books heading so you click on books and it'll be it'll be in there somewhere. His work, books, you'll find it. Uh, but basically, you go there and you can get it at uh, all of your favorite book retailers who sell new books: uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kobo. Uh, it's available in hardcover, ebook format, and unabridged digital audiobook uh, through Simon and Schuster Audio, through Audible. Uh, I think a couple of others, Apple iBooks, might have it. So. As long as you buy it new, uh, I don't really mind where you buy it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, well, thank you so much for the time, David, and thank you for talking about this uh, very intriguing world and looking forward to seeing the book out in the world. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me on to talk about it.